we have to make a difference there between a construction anchor and a concealed uh, anchor for ventilated facades. The Kyle anchor is not a wedge anchor where you put in a in the country uh, in a country wall. It's made specific for panels. It can be porcelain, stone, fiber cement. We have, I think, over 50 varieties of materials that we tested already. And there are not many undercut anchors, concealed undercut anchors that work. There are two different uh, concealed anchors and one of those is Kyle. I'm doing this for 20 years. I've seen people who tried something similar, try to copy it. Quality is not there. I mean, we, we're talking about a high quality product and we have very tight tolerances. And if you can keep those tolerances, you will have breakthroughs, you won't have the whole pull strength. So it is important to have a quality product. In this case, I mean, the architect itself, he has to, uh, to know if he wants to have a ventilated facade or not. This is how uh, everything should start. Now, if he has a ventilated facade, he should calculate that there's going to be a, a gap between the front of the panel and the wall itself. Um, this is where the substructure comes in. I don't think actually that architects have any kind of limitations. This is an engineering uh, feature because the engineer has to think about edge distance and stuff like that. Again, the architect has to know if he need, uh, if he wants a ventilated facade and if he wants a visible or concealed anchor. There are not limitations for the architects actually with the ventilated facades because they stick uh, away from the wall, they stay away from the wall. They have actually uh, even more possibilities to create the fantasy mm. what most architects have. One of our biggest issues uh, is the installers. The first time we, we don't have enough qualified installers in the United States as, uh, as now. So one of the problem is that the installers are a little bit scared about the system. However, once they receive uh, the right information and it's uh, a lot of substructure companies have a small little video on the website, you know, that show the whole process, uh, how it's going up. And once I, if the substructure company or I talk to the installers, they feel much more comfortable because it is a very straightforward application. Again, but it's like uh, if you're driving a bike, if you never did this, you're scared. Once you know how to drive it, you don't care anymore. Um, so another big issue is when customers start about the price. Yes, it is not as cost effective as to model something uh, on a wall. However, if you see the safety factor, if you see the lifespan of the Kyle anchor or any rain screen facades, if it's visible or concealed, you have a higher safety factor in these facades and also uh, the lifespan, it's much higher in a ventilated or again, depends, some say ventilated, some say rain screen. Uh, we still have to agree in the United States what kind of term we're going to use. <laughs> I try to use ventilated rain screen facades because this rain screen is a little bit different than the ventilator if you have also ventilation. So, but once you see all the benefits of a ventilated facade, the costs are actually less over time. So it doesn't help you if you model something on for pennies and this panel comes down in two or three uh, years. Worst case scenario falls on somebody's head what happened actually just recently in New York. Also the efficiency of the installation and the safety factor and the lifespan. This product, ventilated facades, are actually more cost effective than to model something on the wall. Over time, we work with all kinds of materials. Uh, we are really not uh, limited. I mean, limitations come into uh, metal panels. And it's not limitations. Metal panels don't need a concealed uh, anchor. You can weld a stud on the back of the panel, use a nut and uh, uh, secure it that way. Other than that, I mean, sure, honeycomb doesn't need a uh, concealed, uh, if you have a uh, porcelain tile with a honeycomb or natural stone, actually most is natural stone with a honeycomb, you don't need a Kyle anchor uh, for that either. Uh, there are other uh, 
products available for this kind of applications. Uh, other than that, I mean, we work with close to every material on the market right now. It really doesn't matter if it's a manufactured uh, product or a natural store. Each material should be tested. Um, let's take even a porcelain tile that should be very uniform. As soon as the color changes, the pull strength will change also, or the tensile strength. So, but this is now this is not going to be a, a very uh, high number. It's going to be in the small Newton meters. I mean, really, it's, it's you, you can pretty much say most tiles have kind of the same pull strength. They vary a little bit uh, in pull strength. Now, in natural stone, it's a little bit. It's actually more complicated. It is a natural product. And it can be that uh, the natural stone can vary in uh, the pull strength from the left side of the choir to the right side of the choir. So this can, can change because, you know, the stone on this side uh, got compressed a little bit more than uh, on the other side. It doesn't have to be. It can be. So especially natural stones. And we like actually to test our materials uh, every five years to make sure that our numbers are correct. Okay. This okay. is, uh, again, but testing has to be done. The engineer needs those numbers to make the cal uh, his calculations, his or those. First of all, Kyle is not a testing facility. So pretty much uh, claim on the sheets that if somebody wants to make independent tests, there's no problem. We actually assist with those tests. Yeah, if somebody wants to go in the independent lab, and does a test. We assist them with uh, drilling the material, you know, making sure they're getting the right depth and everything. And then we have also to look at some standards. We have to make sure that the testing facilities use specific standards for concealed anchors. One of the issues in the United States is they, with a concealed anchor, they compare it to a country anchor what goes in the wall. Uh, this will change uh, shortly. I'm, uh, we, we talk already to the ICC. Uh, we look for taking some ASTMs. So we are preparing actually all uh, the necessary steps to get some standards in general for ventilated facades in the United States. What we need is 10 samples of each materials they want to test. If they have different thicknesses of materials, we have to use different anchor lengths for, for the materials. So we will need 10 uh, pieces, eight by eight uh, inches for the pull test. If you have different colors, if you have different thicknesses, you might want to send two, three, like 20 or 30, let's say, uh, samples to Kyle. Uh, because even if you have a uniform product like a porcelain tile, we still will have uh, some uh, tolerances in there. And if you have 10 samples, then we can take the average which gives us a much more accurate number. Out of this average, actually, we should also include the safety factor. And then you have pretty much a number uh, in kilonewtons, you can convert it later on in uh, pounds, uh, where the architect, again, can do his calculations with. In natural stone, in most cases, we have tolerance and thickness. This thickness has to be compensated. If we use the regular handheld uh, Kyle machine, the zero point of your drilling or the starting point is the back of the panel. This will push the panel, if you have tolerances, one panel will stick farther out as a facade as the other. So we have to compensate for that. So now, instead of using the vacuum of the handheld machine, we have to clamp down uh, the machine to bring the zero point of the drilling to the front of the panel. This means you do your adjustments, you make your drilling adjustments according to your thinnest material. The machine will then countersink everything else that is thicker as your thinnest material. As you can see, yeah, thicker materials will get this kind of countersink, as I say, to compensate for the thickness of uh, the stone. This means that now that we have the countersink, 
the stone panel that is thicker gets on, on the facade itself gets pushed farther back and makes a uniform facade. This is not necessary if the stone is gauged. Some uh, uh, manufacturers say, okay, we're going to polish them, you're going to have a uniform uh, tile or panel. Other projects require a rough surface, like it should look like a, a regular natural stone. You don't need this either over there because you go, you know, it's, it's not going to be polished, it's going to be a rough surface. It's really just if you have a smooth surface and your stone varies in thickness. If you have CNC machines, you can do this much easier on a CNC machine or with a Kyle conveyor table. Easy adjustments. With a handheld unit, it's not difficult. You just have to clamp the machine down instead of using the body. The Kyle anchoring machine, in a normal procedure, it creates a vacuum that is pretty much sucking onto the material that you drill. As I said, in this case, your zero point, the point that you start your 15 millimeter, for example, to drill, uh, is the back of the panel. If you clamp the machine down and uh, have it a little more forward so you can slide the panels uh, under the machine, then, because now you have a constant uh, uh, measurement from the machine to the distance of the table. So now your zero point is the front uh, of the panel. It sounds a little complicated. I have actually a drawing. I have made actually a drawing for that. Once I explain it and I show you I show the drawing, then everything is much more understandable. This is only necessary if you use the handheld unit. If you use a conveyor table or a CNC machine, you make those adjustments uh, right there. So you don't need to clamp your machine machine down. The machine itself is going to do this adjustment. Okay. And it's still and it's still a one step drill. There's no two steps. Uh, with a countersink, you have a special drill bit that has instead one diamond uh, on the tip to drill into the material, another diamond on the shoulder on the drill bit that creates the countersink. So it's a one-step trolling. There is nothing to think about. The neoprene has actually several purposes. Number one is we have tolerances everywhere. We have a slight tolerance in the anchor, what is minimal, but it's it's like not even 0.4 millimeters. It's a very tight tolerance. So is the bolt. Now we have the aluminum clip where the tolerances are a little bit higher. However, this neoprene can compensate for those tolerances so the, the clip if it's too loose it doesn't spin around like a propeller so it still has a nice uh, grip actually i can uh, show you right here you know it doesn't spin uh freely it, it, it should spin freely because this is one of the purpose of the kyle anchor but it does, shouldn't spin like a propeller so this is uh, one of the two actually also to give it a little bit more uh, support you no, know, so that's spin, and it doesn't happen. It, we never had this issue, but it's another safety factor to keep moisture out of the undercut hole. Again, uh, it is proven with several tests that only a small amount, even on the heaviest grain, only a small amount will go behind the panel itself. But even there, for the rain to penetrate, you know, into the hole, uh, into the undercut hole, is close to impossible. However, neoprene makes it impossible. The anchor and bolt combination is made for, for clips that are fit for the for the Kyle anchor and bolt. Now, what Kyle does is they stagger their anchor and bolt in 1.5 millimeter increments. Um, they prefer a wall thickness of the clip of three millimeter or little less to have the right parameters again for the bolt and anchor combination. It's easier, it's an easier installation because you cannot over screw the bolt into the anchor, you cannot push out the material, and you don't have to be careful again, you just uh, uh, screw the insert the, the anchor into the uh, bolt into the anchor and once you hit 
once the, the, the bolt head hits the clip, that's it. It doesn't can go farther. Now, if you have a clip that doesn't fit the Kyle angle, has a four millimeter wall thickness or five millimeter wall thickness, then we have to use the grub screw. Uh, but it's like a threaded uh, rod and has a hexagon on one uh, side punched in. So you can use a three millimeter uh, bit to screw it again into the angle. Now, there you have to be a little bit more careful because this stud you can over screw. If you're not careful, you will push out the material. So once you hit the bottom of the undercut anchor, the, the, uh, the anchor will lock. It's not spinning around anymore. So you have to turn uh, the crab screw again about a quarter to a half a turn again, uh, 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 out of the anchor to allow the anchor to spin free. Then you have the clip, you go over it, then you take your nut, you have to hold uh, the stud with the hex, with a hex bit, and then you tighten up your screw. So it's not that we don't prefer it, it's just for the customer an easier installation if he uses the anchor bolt combination instead of the anchor grub screw nut combination. If the customer wants, again, it, it's not that, again, it's not that we prefer it, it's an easy uh, uh, installation and or the more cost effective. For the installation and the parts themselves, there are several, uh, several reasons. Number one, the Europeans built for the future. Uh, in most cases, this, uh, American uh, buildings, you know, they stand many for 50 years and then they say it's a teardown. It's one of the reasons. Another reason is energy efficiency. In Europe, the energy efficiency is a very important part of a building. This is starting right now in the United States. It's relatively new to insulate your buildings from the outside and make sure that uh, you don't lose uh, heat or cold. So it's the energy efficient itself. Actually, there is uh, studies from NASA that say if you use a ventilated facade and put the whole thing uh, together, like really like a rain screen with insulation and everything, you can save up to 30% of energy cost. What is a lot, especially in high rises, uh, larger buildings, um, even at homes, if you see this way. However, this system, uh, it's barely used in regular homes. If you want to use uh, ventilated facades, we barely see it. They exist, but we barely see it. In most cases, if we have ventilated facades on uh, residential buildings, it's because they wanted larger format uh, panels. And now you have to secure them again uh, the correct way. Again, mortar is not going to do it. So you have to secure it mechanically. Again, it can be undercut, it can be visible. However, larger panels, even in the United States, in most cases require a mechanical angle. Another big issue is actually only, not even 10% in the American market uh, in facades, not even 10% they use ventilated facades or any kind of cladding material, you know, that makes the building to look nicer. In most cases, they still use mortar and uh, to cut it if they have smaller panels or they use stucco and so on. The ventilated facade business in Europe, especially in West Europe, it's 60% instead of, I think, 8% in the United States. So that's the huge factor. When we started to promote the Kyle Anchor over 20 years ago in the United States, uh, we had a big issue. Again, one of the issues was installation. Second installa uh, issue was the price. We pointed always the safety factor out of this system. And as of today, I think it's the one most, the most important factor of a ventilated facade. If it's done correctly, the European technical approval gives it a lifespan of at least 50 years. So here again, we have um, products that are stainless steel and aluminum. This is going to hold 
much longer than only 50 years. They're, they're, they're not corrode that easily. The change the last 10 years is actually that architects, especially architects, see the benefit of uh, using a rain screen facade because again of uh, the different aspects, you know, the different uh, architectural uh, realizations they can do. And again, it doesn't have for, for an architect, the safety and the, uh, the, the efficiency is in, it's not that big of, a, uh, of an issue. However, now it becomes more and more because even architects want to show when they going to do a green building. So now we don't have only the safety factor, what was the big seller in the first in first uh, uh, 20 years or first 10 years. Now we have also the energy efficiency of a proper installed ventilated facade. And I think this is going again because we see more cities, more states want to become more green and the ventilated rain screen facade is definitely uh, superior to any adhesive.